The epic poem Beowulf is just over 1,000 years old. What was seen for centuries as an interesting example of Old English from a linguistics perspective has in the past century transmuted itself into a work of great literature. So my first quotation uh, says there, Beowulf bears the distinction of appearing to be basic, one man having three battles. Well, it's actually something much deeper. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is... Um, uh, this lecture is going to provide an introduction to archetypal literary criticism through a reading of Beowulf. We're going to have a very, very quick summary of Beowulf at the beginning in just a couple of minutes. and um, <clears throat> But then uh, the main concern is going to be um, thinking about the composition of the poem, um, as well as the rhetorical significance of the poet's blending of his characters from a pagan Scandinavian world, which is very foreign to him, with his, with his own dark, anxious, Anglo-Saxon Anglo Christianity of the pre-Norman conquest at the end of the first millennium when he's writing it. So um, let's just do a really quick summary. As that first uh, quotation says, it appears to just be um, Beowulf battling three monsters, Grendel, Grendel's mother, the dragon. So first of all, let's take a look at where the action of the poem is taking place. This is Scandinavia, of course. <clears throat> and um, we have Harrow to the Hall, which is um, which is Hrothgar's Hall, which is where most of the first two-thirds of the poem takes place. There um, in the largest island um, in between Denmark and Sweden, present-day Denmark and Sweden. And so Beowulf is coming there. And then... Um, um, and in the last third of the poem, he's traveling across the sea and then back to what we would call Sweden now. So, so just a really brief summary of uh, the poem to kind of refresh you. Um, it begins, obviously, with a description of the founding of the Danish nation with shield chiefson, um, which has got kind of an epic archetypal quality to it because, of course, um, he was a foundling. And so... Um, in the same way that like Superman or other people who, you know, appear to be orphans or appear to be foundlings and then they go on to do something great. Um, so we get the beginning of the Danish nation. We also get um, the poem is really beautiful in that it's got this, you know, consistent tone all through the poem. So the poem begins with a funeral, um, that of the founder of the Danish nation, and it will end with one as well, too. So bullet point two, Beowulf travels to Denmark. He defeats the first monster, Grendel. And then I've got there in the third bullet point, information on Germanic culture. And that's just, that's all the way through the poem. But we can really notice it um, right after the fight with Grendel. And uh, we get a long sort of strange interruption there um, with a story that's called the Finsburg episode, which kind of parallels a little bit the blood feud. Um, which is going to be in point number four there. Uh, Grendel's mother comes and attacks, <clears throat> and uh, Beowulf has to go to where she's at in this you know, dangerous, scary mountain lake that's infested with sea monsters. He defeats her, and then the last third of the poem, um, after Beowulf has returned home, over 50 years have passed, and then a dragon and a treasure are introduced, and Beowulf, of course, uh, dies fighting and defeating the dragon. So there's the brief summary and then of course the somber ending because there is Beowulf's funeral um, coupled with the fact that the um, character in the poem um, that Wiglaf and the poet himself tell us at the end that uh, Beowulf's entire tribe is going to be decimated after their rivals uh, find, find out that Beowulf is dead. So now, kind of important to understand the significance overall of Beowulf is to just recognize briefly why does each monster attack. And so Grendel, and this is overlooked oftentimes, and it's very important. So Grendel attacks, and we'll look at this um, when we look at the text in a few minutes. Grendel attacks specifically because of the loud, the din of the banquet hall. There's a, a poem being sung. It's a poem of man's beginnings, and he's annoyed by the, the din of the banquet hall. Grendel's mother <clears throat> attacks for an entirely different reason to avenge her son's death, and that's, as I said, linked in a parallel to the explanation of the blood feuds which are going on in that portion of the poem right in the middle. 
um, and then the dragon because a jeweled goblet was stolen. So, and <clears throat> uh, of course, the jeweled goblet which was stolen reminds us that uh, one of the first um, important scholars of Beowulf, perhaps the most, the f uh, first important scholar of Beowulf is Tolkien himself. <clears throat> and so for those people who come to Beowulf having already seen or having already read The Hobbit, they recognize that there are some uh, some things that Tolkien took right out of Beowulf in order to to write The Hobbit with smog. Um, but anyway, um, so Tolkien, this uh, essay that I've got down there, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, that was written in the 1930s. And this is the point where Beowulf... Uh, the poem got to be taken differently. It started to be taken differently because up until that point, it had just been looked at as a work for its linguistic value of Old English. And Tolkien argued that it was a work of great literature. And um, <clears throat> so as it says here, Tolkien said, um, it's a poem by a learned man writing of old times who looking back at the heroism and sorrow feels in them something permanent and something symbolical. Now, the reason I started with that is because that's what this lecture is about and that is the archetypal significance of this poem is that this poet who's i'm going to go into the dates of when the poem was written when it was composed and then the actual action of the poem the characters which there's about a 400 year um, difference and the poet himself is and of course this is over a thousand years ago the poet himself is looking back and in some ways feeling a little bit of nostalgia i think um at these heroic characters so right so here's a timeline of the poem and we have um there at the top so <clears throat> the poem itself we're fairly certain that it was written in the late 900s in england of course in old english and uh probably in a monastery the person who wrote it was a christian and um <clears throat> So, like I said, uh, the late 900s, so just a little over a thousand years ago is when the poem is actually written down in Old English. However, bullet point number two, the oral composition. So it was probably, it was composed orally, and that was anywhere from 50 to 150 years preceding actual, you know, the um, writing of it. Now, that is not as important as bullet item number three, the um, the action of the poem so that's in the 500 ce now there is one datable fact um, from the poem and that's the death of someone named hyalak who i think dies in um sometime in the early 520s so the action of the poem and as it says in another country so remember the poem is written in england in the late 900s but the action of the poem is taking place 400 years earlier across the sea in Scandinavia in um, you know what is now present-day Denmark and Sweden importantly all of this is before the Norman conquest of 1066 and the you know French ruling class so we're gonna do just a little bit more um, history just for a few minutes to kind of um, you know help illuminate the importance of the the time period of the action of the poem and also the composition of the poem so a little uh, quick recap of the roman empire and english history so the pax romana is the term for the order and flourishing culture the first two centuries ce so between 1800 and 2000 years ago the height of the roman empire and we can see here <clears throat> just a you know a map of the roman empire at its height and you'll see of course in red that's the roman empire and you'll see that uh, what we now call england is mostly red there going up into the north of england um, and that line where it goes uh, where the boundary of the roman empire that's hadrian's wall so let's go back here point number two hadrian's wall so that was constructed in the 120s um, and again so we want to remember that um, the middle and the southern portion of england uh part of the roman empire uh and then we can we can kind of skip down. I want to point out a little bit about uh, the timeline of Christianity because that's important. Because again, the poet who wrote this over a thousand years ago was a Christian and was probably writing it in a monastery in England. So <clears throat> um, uh, during the reign of the Emperor Constantine, um, he Constantine converted to Buddhism or to Buddhism uh, to Christianity. Um, 
and he uh, built a new capital for the Roman Empire um, in the <clears throat> in what is now present day Turkey, in Byzant, what was then Byzantium, uh, renamed it Constantinople. It's of course now the city Istanbul, and then there was a further division between the East and West empires. Um, <clears throat> Good uh, Christianity becomes more popular. It eventually becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380. And then shortly after that, in the early 400s, is really the <clears throat> uh, the empire had been uh, weakening, certainly, for more than 100 years. But by the <clears throat> 400s, Rome frequently attacked and often sacked by invading Germanic tribes. And then, of course, Rome transitions um, sort of unbeknownst to itself in the early mid 400s as the capital of the Roman Empire to what will be the capital of Western Christendom. So good. And then just one other little short thing. So um, so we talked in that last slide about how um, it's in the early 400s that Germanic tribes are invading <clears throat> Italy, sacking Rome, and various Germanic tribes are also invading England at that same time period in the 5th century. Among those invading tribes are the Angles, the, Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes. Um, then a little bit of information about the, I have down there, the Christianization of England began in earnest in 597 because, um, you know, uh, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in 380. So there were Christians in England um before 597 and even before that there were some i think um some s small missionaries from maybe ireland but it really um took off in <clears throat> at the end of the sixth century the beginning of the seventh century so okay great <clears throat> now this is a wonderful quote to sort of once we have that um let's look again and just remember the timeline of what we're looking at here. Again, the poem is composed in the late 900s by a Christian, probably in a monastery, definitely in England. And then, but the action of the poem is taking place in Scandinavia. And so the poet is looking back 400 years to a different country, to his cultural ancestors. And um, so that is that sort of nostalgic looking back is what informs this wonderful quotation um, from James W. Earle's book, Thinking About Beowulf, where he says, Beowulf, like Anglo-Saxon culture generally, strikes the reader as a peculiar blend of these two traditions, resulting in a Christianity that is dark, realistic, anxious, and violent. And I think the poet um, sort of consciously is conscious of the fact that he's writing about this other time period and <clears throat> he's looking back on it with nostalgia, with respect. Um, and we'll look uh, specifically at one little point um, early in the poem where he you know, recognizes that these people um, that he's writing about, they're not Christians as he knew that they weren't. So good. <clears throat> Before we get into looking at the poem itself, let's take a quick um, just... Uh, definition of archetypal literary criticism and um, then just chat about that for a moment. So um, this is the way I define it, the use of the theories of, and you know, it's challenging to figure out uh, who are all the most important theorists of archetypal literary criticism. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost is Carl Jung, um, who's the grandfather of it. Joseph Campbell is the person who's probably the most familiar and popularized archetype Archetypes and Archetypal Literary Theory in general, with his <clears throat> book, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. That, of course, that book by Joseph Campbell, Hero with a Thousand Faces, um, was very influential to George Lucas when he was writing Star Wars in the 1970s. <clears throat> so you can, <clears throat> and you can see that um, if you know a little bit about Archetypal Literary Theory, um, you can see that Joseph Campbell's archetypes, um, characters, <clears throat> character types are, it's like George Lucas just took them right out of Campbell's book and put them in Star Wars. So, for example, we'll put a, the definition of archetype up there. <clears throat> so, for example, um, 
archetypal characters, which Joseph Campbell wrote about, for example, the wise old religious hermit, um, the hero with a thousand faces. So it's the hero going on a quest. So an old uh, religious hermit, the hero of the story going on a quest to renew the land. Um, <clears throat> You see those in Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi. And then even in, so it says there, my definition for archetype, an icon or paradigm of an abstract idea. And it can also, so it can, so that's a good definition, a formal definition. But again, um, we could have archetypal character types like um, uh, the old religious hermit, the hero, um, you know, moving beyond just Joseph Campbell in the Star Wars. Um things like the trickster figure, the rebel, all of these different character types, and um, then even plot elements. So for example, to go back to Joseph Campbell and to George Lucas's um, rendering of Campbell's ideas in Star Wars, you know, the first Star Wars from the late 70s, episode four, I think it would be called. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for an example of a little um, an archetypal plot element. So one of the things which Carl Jung postulated, which was important to the process of individuation, is the uh, recognition of one's shadow, the darker aspect of oneself. <clears throat> so for example, um, how, how would this, this plays out actually really perfectly, it's kind of cool, in um, the second Star Wars movies, The Empire Strikes Back, when Luke, <clears throat> for example, is um, he's on Dagobah. Dagobah is kind of functions perfectly in an archetypal sense as uh, like a journey to the underworld or what um, archetypal theorists sometimes call the night sea journey. They're journeying to some sort of dark underworld, <clears throat> very much like Dagobah. And, um, but anyway, there's a little scene where Luke goes into a cave and He's getting ready to go in there, and, and he says something like, um, what's in there to Yoda? Yoda says, only that, which you bring in with you. And then he goes in there. It's his meeting of a shadow, which there's this weird little fantasy moment where he thinks he's fighting Darth Vader, even though it's not Darth Vader, who's not on Dagobah, but he feels like it is. And when he kills him, then he looks at the helmet, and in Darth Vader's helmet is Luke's own face. So that would be an example of an archetypal plot element um, which of course comes straight out of Carl Jung's theories. And <clears throat> that's the, you know, meeting of the shadow or the integration of the shadow. So, okay, good. So archetypal literary criticism. And then the last person that I've got there, Marie-Louise von Franz, oh, and, and Northrop Frye is um, the most um, well-known archetypal academic. So he's a famous English professor. <clears throat> then I've got Marie-Louise von Franz down as the other um, really important figure. And to my mind, she's actually probably the best person. Joseph Campbell um, is wonderful to read uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces or The Power of Myth. And that's a wonderful introduction to archetypes, archetypal literary theory. <clears throat> then when you're ready for something a little bit deeper, um, Marie-Louise von Franz is uh, just flawless. She um, she was an analyst and she, uh, a lot of her um, archetypal readings are of, archetypal literary criticism works better in older works of literature. So you're not going to use archetypal literary criticism on something 20th century very well, like Ernest Hemingway or Toni Morrison or something like that. It really works better because it's founded basically on mythology and comparative mythology. Uh, uh, mythology and comparative religion. So archetypal literary criticism literally works best. It's applied best to older works of literature like Beowulf. Uh, Marie-Louise von Franz does it with um, fairy tales. She has a wonderful uh, book, which is, uh, I think it's just entitled The Archetypal Significance of the Golden Ass or something like that, or an archetypal reading of the Golden Ass, <clears throat> which is a, a Roman novel. It's this wonderful um, Roman novel and uh, she explains and what's what's very interesting and valuable about archetypal literary criticism for example in that book by Marie-Louise von Franz about the Roman novel 
The Golden Ass, she discusses how this novel, you know, which is r- roughly 17, 1800 years old. I forget when it was written. Um, <clears throat> maybe 1800, 1900 years old. Um, the Golden Ass. Um, but she, so it's a good novel. It's interesting to read on its own, just as a work of Roman literature. But she also discusses in there how you can notice that um, perhaps people's Romans appreciation of their own religious beliefs and the the deities that they worshipped um, that there was something uh, that their culture was going to develop something else instead and so that's the sort of significance of the end of the book is the the character there goes through a religious conversion so it's really it's really very interesting so Marilise von Franz is just wonderful um at being able to to write about how archetypal literary criticism will show different um, time periods and moments when culture is changing. So, great. Um, okay, great. So let's uh, let's look at the. We're going to look at Beowulf itself, and we're going to look at three different things, um, <clears throat> three different short sections really in Beowulf, which will give us a. Um, a little bit of an understanding of how to play out archetypal analysis. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, Grendel, why he attacks. And I've written there the din of the banquet hall, and it equals the poet's representation of chaos, nature, and evil. Then we're going to look at, um, we're going to go from there, actually right in that same passage where we look at Grendel attacking. We're going to look at how the poet um, represents, how, how he uses references to God And he does it in this very skillful way. So we'll look at that secondly. And then briefly, we'll look at the end um, and the treasure. So actually, the important uh, um, things to look at, the way I've got them down here, is Grendel in his attack, why he's attacking, the actual writer of the poem, the poet, um, this unknown you know, Christian monk from a little over a thousand years ago, how he uses religious terminology in the poem. And then... Um, not necessarily the dragon, which isn't that interesting to me, but the actual treasure and just a little short description of that at the end. So let's go ahead and go into the poem itself right now. So <clears throat> again, um, so we've got here, um, uh, um, this is, um, you know, Grendel, um, attacking, and so I'll just read this right here um, at the beginning. Um, then a powerful demon, a prowler through the dark, nursed a hard grievance. It harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck in the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings. How the Now, before we get into the religious terminology here, that yellow part is, it seems kind of strange, like, so why is this monster, um, Grendel, the first monster of the three that Beowulf defeats, why is he attacking in the first place? It says, it harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the harp being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling. So it's really interesting. And what I would say here to go back to the slide for just a moment is that what the poet is doing is he's kind of blending together. So Grendel, we'll see really quickly, is, quote, a descendant of Cain. That's definitely important. And what he's going to do is he's so in um, on a really simplistic level, Grendel and Grendel's mother are evil. And the poet says that as much himself. He calls Grendel's mother hell's bride. Um, But what's um, what's also important is to notice how Grendel and his mother come from this wild area, this cold probably area that is really like a representation for how the characters and probably the poet himself would feel about nature. Now, nature can be represented in lots of different ways and literature is represented. And it really depends on the circumstances of the story and the culture and where it's coming from. So for example, to be concrete, when um, nature is represented by you know, American transcendentalists like Ralph Waldo Emerson writing in the 1830s. Well, Ralph Waldo Emerson is has a comfortable life, uh, 
big, beautiful home. He's married. He's got money. So it's really easy for Ralph Waldo Emerson writing in the 1830s about nature to see nature as completely restorative. And it's just like um, almost like an expression of how much he loves God and how much he loves the world. And nature is just beautiful and restorative and wonderful. Likewise, just a couple of decades later, when Walt Whitman writes about nature, it's beautiful, it's euphoric, it's this and that, it's absolutely wonderful. Just go a couple of cent or a couple of decades later when somebody like Jack London is writing about nature, for him it's cold and harsh because within the story and within, you know, where he's writing it from, um, you know, in one of his novels like White Fang or The Call of the Wild or something like that. Well, if you're out too long in nature, you're going to get killed. You're going to freeze to death or you're going to get attacked by a wolf. So nature is a scary, dangerous thing. You know, if you're in Alaska and you're, you know, on a, um, as, a, as opposed to like for Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, basically living in a nice large country home and not having to worry about wolves or the cold or anything like that. So um, the, the circumstances really dictate what nature is going to be like so so for the poet and for the scandinavian characters nature is a really scary thing um and so grendel is kind of a manifestation of that um but let's go back to the actual reading okay so so beyond um grendel and his mother sort of coming out of nature and coming out of the the cold and the marsh and the 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 poet says they come out of the heath and the fen and all of these different um, words that he uses for um, land which uh, can't be cultivated or can't grow crops or doesn't grow crops or something like that. But he's also, as we'll get down here in just a little bit, he's comes from Cain. So, okay, so it harrowed him to hear the din of the loud banquet every day in the hall, the heart being struck and the clear song of a skilled poet telling with mastery of man's beginnings. Now, that also sounds, by the way, like what's going on in Herot, the hall itself. Well, it's the beginning of culture. It's the beginning of human civilization for the poet and for the characters that he's representing there, Hrothgar and Beowulf, etc. Um, what's going on in the hall is the, uh, the Germanic code of honor between them. And then they're literally like, you can't have civilization develop and human culture develop unless you're protected from the elements. And that's exactly what they are. They're inside this great, huge hall, and they're able to drink. Um, they're able to have this story told. So it's really this kind of um, dichotomy there between the beginning of human civilization in the hall, or the beginning of culture, I should say, not human civilization, the beginning of culture. And, um, and then Grendel, this sort of primal force that's coming out of the wilderness. Now, look at what the poet does with religious terminology in the very next sentence. Um, telling with master of man's beginnings how the Almighty had made the earth a gleaming plain girdled with waters. In his splendor, he set the sun and the moon to be earth's lamplight, lanterns for men, and filled the broad lap of the world with branches and leaves. It's very poetic and beautiful, and quickened life in every other thing that moved. Now, you'll notice what he did there. He just kind of blended. He said the song of the skilled poet who's in this hall in Herot 400 years before the poet lived. And then as he describes it, it sounds like Genesis. And of course it does because um, the poet himself is a Christian, but he knows, and we'll see in just um, less than 100 lines, he knows that his characters that he's writing about are not Christian. Hrothgar, Beowulf, etc. They're not Christian. But anyway, so times were pleasant for the people there until finally one, a fiend out of hell, began to work his evil in the world. Grendel was the name of this grim demon haunting the marches, marauding round the heath, the desolate fens. He had dwelt for a time in misery among the banished monsters, Cain's clan, whom the creator had outlawed and condemned as outcasts. For the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. So, um, so we'll get, um, the poet is a little bit ambiguous about um, where exactly Grendel and his mother come from. He basically associates them. At some point he says that um, he says that uh, Grendel is Cain's son, but then he also says that um, that Grendel was fatherless. Um, 
So we just will associate Grendel and Grendel's mother with Cain. That's what he wants us to do. And then that is a really pretty brilliant choice too, because up. Uh, so think about it for just a moment. Again, we know that the uh, poet who wrote this is Christian. And so what he's doing is he's in a, you know, most people who read this recognize from, you know, the Judeo-Christian tradition in Genesis, uh, the story of Cain and Abel. And so think for just a moment about how important that is, because Cain and Abel, Cain is actually, so he's obviously, he kills his brother Abel quickly. And, you know, it's just a couple of verses. There's very little that's written there, but it speaks volumes. Um it's uh it's really interesting because um so if you just take the you know the worldview that's being uh given to us there or the story that's being given to us in Genesis um then what we have uh you know God creates um Adam he creates him out of earth breathes life into him then he creates Eve out of Adam's rib and actually then Cain is um the firstborn so Cain is actually the first person like first normal human being because he's not created by god through earth or created like eve through adam's rib he's you know uh he's the son of adam and eve so he's the first person he's literally like the first like normal person one might say and he's also the first murderer so the very first person is also it's kind of like a dark way to really think about what the hebrew scriptures are telling us what's the very first person like well he's a murderer you know, um, he kills his own brother. Um, anyway, so, um, so it's a, it's a really interesting choice because then, you know, just of course, in those few lines from the Hebrew scriptures, Cain offers, um, Cain brings, I think it's called, it says it's an offering and Cain is a tiller of the fields. Abel is a shepherd. And then Abel brings, um, an offering and, um, anyway, so, so you know the story. So, um, Let's go back to the um, line 107 there. For the killing of Abel, the eternal Lord had exacted a price. Cain got no good from committing that murder because the Almighty had made him anathema. And out of the curse of his exile, there sprang ogres and elves and evil phantoms and the giants too who strove with God. So we get this interesting thing where this, for the poet and his audience, you know, a, a thousand years ago, his Christian audience He's writing something that's now it's kind of connected just in a remote way with um, for them, the Old Testament. So it's really this brilliant kind of like little plot device to say that. OK, great. Um, now, but what I wanted to point out about um, I'm going to skip down here just a little bit to this other area. And um, so this is after Grendel's attack. And um, what I've got highlighted here, this is the only time where the poet is going to really make a distinction between the people, the characters that are in the poem, Hrothgar and his men in this case, where the poet is going to make a distinction between uh, the characters of the poem who he knows are not Christian and himself and his audience. So what does he write here? Line 175. Um, So, you know, Hrothgar and uh, the others are obviously upset because Grendel's attacking the hall and killing all these people. And so Hrothgar and his people, the poet says, sometimes at pagan shrines, they vowed offerings to idols, swore oaths that the killer of souls might come to their aid and save the people. And by the way, this is the only time in the whole poem where the poet speaks in a way about the characters, who he likes. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily with disdain, but, um, you know, you can tell that he's almost upset or disappointed or something um <clears throat> that was their way he says that was their way their heathenish hope deep in their hearts they remembered hell the almighty judge of good deeds and bad the lord god head of the heavens and the high king of the world was unknown to them oh cursed is he who in time of trouble has to trust his soul has to thrust his soul in the fire's embrace forfeiting help he has nowhere to turn but blessed is he who after death can approach the Lord and find friendship in the Father's embrace. So he puts this almost like little evangel, like evangelizes to us basically in this uh, in this poem. But what I'm trying to point out with the slide here is that um, that the vast majority of the time, the poet's references 
um, R2. So it says there are no Christian references. What do I mean by that? Well, what's noticeable as you go through the poem is all through the poem, there are moments like that where the, po where the poet says something about God, the Lord God, the Almighty One, things like that. But he never mentions Jesus. He never mentions the Virgin Mary. His, as I say there, his references are always pre-Mosaic. Um, <clears throat> so besides the Cain and Abel, one could conjecture there are two or three other places where maybe there's a, just the slightest allusion to um you know, something uh, that, you know, that's, that's coming from Genesis, basically. So, um, okay, let's go back to, um, the next area, and that's going to be, so, as I said here, um, his, throughout most of the poem, besides that one little part of about 15 lines, through most of the poem, what he's going to do is not only interject his own voice, but also even characters in the poem will speak about um, God in this sort of slightly abstract sense where you can read it probably as, um, as he wants his audience to sort of see it as, you know, a Christian God. But it's in this sort of almost sly, you know, rhetorical way where he has um, people who wouldn't be saying that say that. So anyway, let me give you an example instead of being so abstract. So uh, this is about the fight with Grendel. This is um, Beowulf is now there um, <clears throat> uh, at Harrow, and uh, Hrothgar goes to sleep. Um, and then the fourth line there, the king of glory, as people had learned, had posted a lookout who was a match for Grendel. A guard against monsters, special protection for, to the Danish prince. And the Geet placed complete trust in his strength of limb and the Lord's favor. So now we're getting this information that Beowulf completely trusts the Lord's favor. Um, he gets ready for this fight. And then we get down here to line 675. Beowulf, the prince, that prince of goodness, proudly asserted. So now this is a direct quotation in line 677. This is, you know... Beowulf literally speaking. When it comes to fighting, I count myself as dangerous any day as Grendel, so it won't be a cutting edge I'll wield to mow him down easily as I might. He has no idea of the arts of war, of shield or sword play, although he does possess a wild strength. Now again, this is all Beowulf talking. It's a direct quotation of Beowulf. No weapons, therefore, for either this knight. Unarmed he shall face me if he if face me he dares. And may the divine Lord in his wisdom grant the glory of victory to whichever side he sees fit. So again, what's happening is it's um almost like the um there's a, like a little bit of a blurring of um of the it's allowing Beowulf to speak in the same terminology really as the Christian poet. Um so in maybe that um, helps to give Beowulf, especially to the poet who's writing it, to his contemporary audience, maybe even to most people reading to, or to a lot of people reading it today, it sort of helps like um, mute for a Christian audience anyway, you know, the contrast between uh, Beowulf and Hrothgar and the others being pagans. So um, <clears throat> pagans in the would be the terminology you know, from a Christian standpoint, from the poet standpoint. Um, <clears throat> and then, but we get this um, something that's really interesting, just a couple of lines down here, line 696. Um, the Lord was weaving a victory on his war loom. Um, so uh, the truth is clear, almighty God rules over mankind and always has. So, but it's kind of an interesting way. Again, there's almost like this blending, <clears throat> this poet, this Christian poet, is writing about these characters that he has respect for and he's he understands that they're not christian which is maybe slightly troubling to him and so there's this kind of blending in there so good um now the last thing that i wanted to bring up here was this last bulleted item there where it says treasure um and how um this is just uh the the thing which is really interesting uh, towards the end isn't so much necessarily the 
fight with the dragon, which is not that remarkable, but the actual treasure. And I think the really beautiful way. <clears throat> so we get to the, you know, the last third of the story and uh, Beowulf has gone back and he's become the king himself and he has been a good king. Um, and there is a uh, so now we get this new introduction, of this interesting plot here where there is this treasure that's been buried and there's a dragon guarding it. And so the what I've got highlighted here on line 2231 is the description of the treasure itself, which is so beautiful. So I wrote there um, that what the treasure, you know, in a real simple sense, what does the treasure symbolize? Well, it's the transient nature of wealth or power in general. The transient nature of wealth or power in general. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at where the treasure actually came from, which is so beautifully written. So there was <clears throat> apparently, um, well, it says in the poem itself that the treasure had been there for a thousand winters. So um, some other... Uh, some other tribe or some other race of people a thousand years before. Uh, well, so we'll just read this. There were many other heirlooms heaped inside the earth house because long ago with deliberate care, some forgotten person had deposited, <coughs> excuse me, some, uh, some forgotten person had deposited the whole rich inheritance of a highborn race in this ancient cache. Death had come and taken them all in times gone by, and the only one left to tell their tale, the last of their line, could look forward to nothing but the same fate for himself. He foresaw that his joy in the treasure would be brief. Now, this is kind of a long um, uh, passage, but I want to look at how beautiful this is. So, a newly constructed barrow stood waiting, and into it, the keeper of the hoard had carried all of the goods in the goldenware. So he's carried this last one single person of this entire nation who's, you know, was a thousand years before Beowulf had brought all this stuff in. And now he says in line uh, 2247, now earth hold what earls once held and heroes can no more. It was mined from you first by honorable men. My own people have been ruined in war. One by one, they went down to death, looked at their last on sweet life in the hall. And now, and he actually talks about the treasure in these really kind of wonderful ways because he talks about it in respect to his, you know, former comrades. I am left with nobody to bear a sword or to burnish uh, plated goblets. The companies have departed. Um, there's no more helmet shiner who should polish the metal. The coat of mail that came through all the fights. Um, nor may webbed mail range far and wide on the warlord's back beside his mustered troops. No trembling harp, no tuned timber, no tumbling hawk swerving through the hall. No swift horse pawing the courtyard. Now again, just look at how beautiful and sad this is. Pillage and slaughter have emptied the earth of entire peoples. And so he mourned as he moved about the world, deserted it's literally the saddest, it's the saddest thing in Beowulf. It's one of the saddest passages in literature. Um, so this person deposits all of the gold and all of the treasure from his, you know, um, tribe of people. And he, and then after this, uh, almost like this, um, you know, prayer or something like that, or this remembrance, he says, uh, or the poet says, and so he mourned as he moved about the world, deserted and alone, lamenting his unhappiness day and night until death's flood brimmed up in his heart. So <clears throat> pretty sad. And uh, then, of course, so this treasure, which, uh, you know, sits there for a thousand. I think it says it in the text, it says um, the treasure is there for a thousand winters before <clears throat> Beowulf and the dragon fight. Um, and now, and just briefly, I should mention, I think it was actually Joseph Campbell who pointed out, like, why is a dragon such a, an interesting invention? Um, and it's because what a dragon is, it's, um, it's a combination of two things, which, again, this is from Joseph Campbell. 
<clears throat> it's a combination of a snake, a serpent, and then probably um, an eagle. So, um, yeah, so it's a, it's like a, Campbell says that the dragon is um, um, the snake or the serpent is um, bound to earth. And then it's combined with an eagle, which, you know, has the possibility of flight. And so that's what that's why this, you know, idea of a dragon is such a beautiful and strange thing to us. Good. So um, and then, of course, um, what happens at the end? Well, uh, Beowulf and the dragon fight. They both get killed. The dragon's dead, but Beowulf is mortally wounded. And um, then it's kind of a reflection of again this description of the treasure which as i said in the slide is a um it's a very poetic meditation on the transient nature of power and wealth in general so this treasure which was it nobody knows where it come where it came from um it one person deposited it all there a thousand years ago and then the dragon um guarded it i think for 300 years and now Beowulf wants to see it before he dies, but then we're also told at the end of the poem that um, <clears throat> once warring tribes find out that Beowulf, this great king, is dead, they're going to come and slaughter all the people as well, too. So, of course, it's like this, you know, kind of uh, sad ending. There's no other way to put it to the poem. But it gives us this, um, you know, it, just kind of on a simplistic level, what is the treasure representing? Well, it's representing that power and wealth in the story at least and maybe in general that power and wealth are always transient and that um you know because of just the strange nature of the way the world works you know you can't rely on that and i mean he could make it up into a more of a christian theme if he wanted to but i think it's really the way he expresses it has got this sort of timeless archetypal quality so Wonderful. So that's the overall um, why this is significant from the point of view of archetypal criticism is <clears throat> just to sort of quickly go back over these three points. Um, that beginning when Grendel attacks, why is he angered? Well, he's angered at the the sound that's coming from Harrod, the sound of the poet um, and the harp. And what they're doing, um, what is being represented there is this um, dichotomy between really not just that Grendel comes from Cain um, and is evil, but also that he and his mother come from nature and nature is so hostile and, and dangerous to, you know, the Scandinavian and Germanic tribes of 1500 years ago. Then of course, the, as we saw, there's this um, skillful use of religious terminology all the way through the poem where the poet sort of blends in and has not only himself but Beowulf speak about God and besides the one passage there that I that I read towards the beginning I think what starts at line 175 besides that most of the time he's sort of trying to um, kind of uh, deliberately blurring um, you know, the difference between himself and the characters. So hopefully that is a not only a good introduction to archetypal theory, but also, you know, um, a clear understanding of what what's really at stake in Beowulf and why it's such a beautiful poem. It's uh, it's more than just the monsters. It's um, this strange and beautiful moment of a thousand years ago where this Anglo-Saxon Christian poet is writing about things that took place 400 years before um, and writing about it with nostalgia and reference and uh, reverence really wonderful and that's the end <laughs>